My name is John Furman. Welcome to our EDS Awareness Educational Series webinar. Before we introduce our speaker, we'd like to give you an overview of our free program for those that are attending for the first time. So we'll go over uh, who we are, what is our program, uh, a new program that we're very excited about, and then introduce our speaker and have a Q&A. So again, my name is John Furman. I manage the National EDS Awareness and Chronic Pain Partners nonprofit organization based in Cincinnati, Ohio. My daughter Deanna, who's also on the call, leads the Cleveland, Ohio EDS support group. She was diagnosed with hypermobile EDS in 2008, the same year my wife Carol passed away with breast cancer. I was a caregiver for my wife who struggled with undiagnosed EDS for over 30 years. We introduced our program at the 2012 EDNF conference to help EDSers form independent local support groups and spread EDS awareness in their communities. We have been a sponsor for these conferences for the last six years. And we've started over 115 groups to date. Each group is given their own free website with a link from the directory and map. We receive feedback that conferences provide valuable information and social opportunities that many cannot afford physically or financially to attend in person. So we decided to bring the speakers to you through the free EDS Awareness Educational Series. We typically meet each month around 7.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. All the programs are free, the meeting announcements, and whenever possible, the webinar recordings will be posted on our website at tdsawareness.com for later replay. You can receive email announcements for future sessions by requ requesting the free guide on our site. Tonight's presentation is sponsored by Body Support Store, where you'll find over 250 products selected by EDSers for EDSers. Proceeds from our store and donations to a nonprofit organization help fund our free programs. Please visit the store and check out the helpful products that we offer. So just a general disclaimer, this presentation contains general information about EDS. Members of the EDS community voluntarily participate in this program. The information is not advice. If you're having medical problems now, please call 911 or the emergency services at your location. Always consult your doctor before making any changes to your treatment. Our Physician CME Educational Program was introduced in September 2017. It provides free continuing education credits physicians need to renew their licenses. It is receiving an overwhelming response from the medical community and is the first online EDS course providing CME credits. It covers diagnosis, classification, and treatment of EDS and associated conditions. And any healthcare providers interested in learning more about EDS are encouraged to view the presentations whether or not they desire the CMEs. As a patient, you have the opportunity to make a difference and improve awareness and understanding of EDS by encouraging your physicians and healthcare providers to participate. You may provide them with a website address, which is ellers-danlos-cme.org, and also print brochures about the program that are available on the CME site there. Uh, you can go to the top menu and click uh, the button or brochure, and then you can download or print them yourself. There's also an option to easily order multiple copies through the Vista Print link provided, which uh, gives you a 20% off discount for their uh, printing services. So uh, you can also, if you want more details, watch the webinar on our edsawareness.com or chronicpainpartners.com website. And a reminder uh, to review upcoming speakers. 
please also visit that page for the full schedule. For tonight's presentation, well, those that are attending live will have the opportunity for Q&A after the presentation. Add your questions at any time by clicking the Q&A icon at the top of your screen. After typing in your question, click the orange button to submit. Our speaker tonight is Susan Tran, PhD, and uh, she's going to talk about partnering with families and youth with EDS and about uh, functional disability. And she has completed her doctoral fellowship at the Division of Behavioral Medicine and Clinical Psychology. Um, she spent several years at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center and had a clinical psychology pre-doctoral internship at O'Grady Residency in Behavioral Medicine. Her PhD is in clinical psychology from the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, as well as uh, her MS, and then her BA is from Marquette University. And Susan's ma major areas of interest include pediatric psychology, stress and coping in chronic illness, functioning in youth with chronic pain, child anxiety, family and peer relationships, and dissemination of behavioral health interventions. And she's had the opportunity to work with Dr. Brad Tinkle, who is a well-known geneticist in the EDS community. So uh, we're very pleased to have Susan with us tonight, and I want to extend you a warm welcome, Susan. I'm going to go ahead and turn over the microphone to you now. Great. Thank you so much, Diana. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to talk to you tonight about some of my work with patients with EDS. Um, pediatric patients and their parents. Um, I want to thank Deanna and John for setting up this webinar. I think this is a great organization doing important work and bringing this information to families and providers out in the community. Um, Deanna did such a great job um, describing my background of my work and where I'm coming from. I just want to tell you a little bit more about my experiences, um, what kind of I think prepares me to talk about this topic. Um, so I'm trained as a pediatric psychologist, which means that um, I'm a clinical psychologist and I've worked primarily with children, adolescents, and their families um, and children and adolescents who have been experiencing medical conditions and especially chronic medical conditions. Um, I've done a lot of my clinical work and research in pain and GI clinics, which is where I was introduced to patients with EDS, um, and so primarily the type of EDS that I've had um, exposure to in my clinical work and research has been the hypermobile type, so that will be the type that I'll be focusing on today. Um, I'm currently at DePaul University, um, so as a professor, I'm not doing as much hands-on clinical work at this time, but I do teach and conduct research and supervise graduate students, um, and my research team, including my graduate students, has continued to collaborate with different children's hospitals to research how EDS affects families' lives. Um, and affects the, the functioning of children and adolescents with EDS. Um, in the spirit of EDS awareness and um, the great CME pro program that um, John and Deanna have um, just mentioned earlier, um, I was thinking a little bit about spreading the awareness of EDS, and so I just wanted to share with you um, some of the fun opportunities that I've had with my graduate students. So as a mentor of graduate students who come in, into my lab, um, you know, they're expecting to get exposure to psychology research. Um, they're not as much um, aware of some of the medical conditions that we might be researching, including EDS. So I often have the opportunity to introduce them to EDS for the first time. Um, and it's been really interesting that while they're working on my research team, they're also getting their clinical experiences out in the community. And a couple of times I've had graduate students on my team um, who have come back to research meetings and said that how they've been so excited that when they're working in their clinical placements, they've come across patients with EDS in unexpected settings. So when they're working in schools or doing neuropsychology evaluations, um, they learned that the patients that they were working with had EDS. And they were really excited because they felt like they knew something about EDS through the work in my, in my lab. Um, and so they didn't have to spend a lot of time asking patients to explain to them what EDS was, that they could really jump into more meaningful questions and figure out how this um, condition has impacted them and their functioning across um, contexts. Um, so they felt like they had an understanding of this condition that they otherwise wouldn't have. Um, so I think that it's important work to do this research and work with up-and-coming trainees in the field doing 
um, research and clinical work so that we get um, more providers who are knowledgeable about this condition. Um, so with that, I'm delighted to move on to the topic for today, partnering with families to improve functioning and use with EDS. Um, so I'm going to do my best to cover, cover this large topic um, in the time that we have today. Um, and as Deanna mentioned, um, I'm happy to do a Q&A at the end of my talk today. So as, as I go through my slides, if you come up with questions, please type them in as you think of them um, so as not to forget them by the end. So my objectives for today's presentation um, are that by the end of the, by the end of today's talk, attendees will be able to describe functional disability in use with EDS, explain factors that impact functional disability, begin creating their own coping toolbox to start addressing functional disability. They'll be able to identify key factors in the relationship between parents and children and utilize communication skills and provide positive support for youth with EDS. So in order to meet these objectives, I will try to follow this agenda. Um, first, I'm going to talk about what functional disability and EDS looks like for children and adolescents and the, some of the factors that might contribute to it. Next, I will talk about what we might do to improve functional disability, so the role of coping strategies, um, where to get those coping strategies, how to use them. And then finally, I will talk about the role of parents and family members um, and specifically discuss some communication strategies that families can use to improve coping and functioning. All right, so we're, let's start with functional disability. Um, so I'd like to start by defining what is functional disability, but rather than starting with a dry academic definition, I thought I would first share some of the responses that we've gotten from adolescent patients with EDS about he, how EDS has affected them. Um, so these were um, open-ended responses we asked adolescents to tell us about living with EDS. Um, so that some of the things that they noted were not being able to do the sports that I used to love. Um, and one of the first things that we think of when we think of functional disabilities are the physical limitation aspect of functional disability, um, not being able to um, do the part of the activities that they previously had enjoyed. Not being able to do things with my friends and family because of EDS symptoms, so extending from those physical limitations to social activities as well. It's hard to keep up with my friends when we hang out because I can't do all the things that they do. And so this is both the physical and social limitations of EDS. And I feel as if I can't do everything that a normal teen can. Um, so this quote starts to bring attention to why functional disability is important. Um, not only is it the reduction in physical and social activities, um, but there's so many negative feelings surrounding the limitations um, that people have that are important to patients. We have to consider all of that as well. So these quotes really illustrate the definition of functional disability well. Um, functional disability is limitations in daily functioning across contexts. Um, and for kids and adolescents, that some of the important contexts for them are their functioning at home, in school, in recreational and social activities. So this is a very broad construct um, covering these different areas. And being functionally, functionally disabled can mean a range of things. It can mean that one's functioning is reduced so that they're not able to participate in all of the activities that they previously had or they can't do something for as long or in this, with the same intensity. Um, it may be an elimination of an activity so they're not able to participate in a certain activity at all. Um, or for some people, it might be that they participate in activities um, but end up paying the price. So they, they choose to still engage in an activity even though they know that it might mean a flare-up of symptoms later on. Um, so why is functional disability important? Um, I decided to focus this evening's talk on functioning because it's an important topic for families and for providers. Um, so as we saw in this, the previous slides, teens rate missing out on certain activities is one of the things that they notice most about EDS. Um, and we know that building peer relationships and developing new areas of interest are really important things for teens to be doing during adolescence. Um, this is a period of time in their development where it's critical for adolescents to learn more about themselves and start to develop their own identity um, and limiting their functioning um, due to symptoms um, can interfere with that as well. 
Um, so as a pediatric psychologist, when I work with families, functioning is a primary goal of ours. Um, I want to help teens get back to engaging in meaningful activities and minimize the limitations that they experience due to having symptoms. For children with chronic medical conditions, being able to participate in regular activities gives them a sense of normalcy, um, like being able to participate in things that their peers are doing, um, and engaging in activities that are important to us, such as meaningful work, social activities, or recreational activities that one enjoys um, gives us a, a sense of purpose and fulfillment. Um, so as you can see in this first little image on the left side of your screen, right, I think of functioning as a, a key component of quality of life. Um, so when we think about how to improve the quality of life of individuals with chronic medical conditions, um, an important part of that is empowering them to participate in the activities of their choosing to help improve their overall quality of life. We also know that it's important to focus on functioning because participating in regular activities can in itself work to decrease symptoms like pain and fatigue. Um, so I say that with the caveat of I have been very lucky to be work to when I work with families, I'm often working closely with medical teams who know better than I do, certainly as a psychologist, whether a patient is medically safe to engage in regular activities or exercise. Um, so if, if you're not sure, you know, you should always check with your medical provider before engaging in other activities that you're not sure about. Um, but in the case of conditions such as chronic pain, where some of these symptoms um, are not signals of acute injury or illness, but they're still persisting, um, some level of activity can help decrease the pain. Um, so for, uh, in, in many cases, increasing functioning can help decrease those physical symptoms um, or our focus on them at least. Um, so this is another reason that functioning is important to focus on. Um, so functioning is a key part of one's quality of life. Being limited in activities is hard for teens with EDS. Um, so I've been very interested in this and to examine what impacts teens with EDS the most, um, we decided to ask the patients themselves. Um, so I feel like I, I might have a couple good ideas about what's hard about living with EDS, having worked with many of them, um, but before I kind of get put, um, put my um, guesses out there, I, I felt like I should probably hear from them first. Uh, so I asked children and adolescents with EDS, what's the hardest part about having EDS? Um, this was an open-ended question, so they could write in anything that they wanted. Um, and my team looked at their at the responses of the children and adolescents and grouped them um, according to what they wrote. So I'll show you a little bit about what they said. Um, so the number one answer for what the hardest thing about having EDS was um, was pain. So over a third of our participants named pain specifically as the hardest part about having EDS. The next most common answer was other physical symptoms. So this was open-ended, so they could write in anything they want. So there were a lot of, um, there was a wide variety of physical symptoms. There's some people wrote about dizziness or about muscle tone, muscle spasms, joint dislocations. Um, so kind of to, to get the flavor of that without just having um, little sample sizes of one for everything, kind of lumped that into physical symptoms. Um, and third, another physical symptom, participants specifically called out fatigue as the hardest part about having EDS. So these top three answers, pain, physical symptoms, um, and fatigue, highlight for me the severity of physical symptoms that patients experience, um, noting that these are the hardest things for them um, and the constellation of things they experience with EDS. Um, but we also highlight some variability across patients. So no two patients wrote the same thing for their answers. Um, and, well, maybe actually some of them may have just written pain since that was the most common answer. Some people wrote a lot lengthier answers, um, but pain was a common one. But since in general, there weren't a, weren't a lot of similarities across answers. And even if we think in terms of physical symptoms, um, my pain, physical symptoms, and fatigue, individuals say different symptoms are the worst for them. The next two most common answers that children and adolescents wrote were social limitations and physical limitations. Um, so these two answers relate to that functional disability that I was talking about. Um, so these are both important parts of functional disability, important contexts of functioning for children and adolescents um, being limited in these activities. 
Um, so from this study, this open-ended question that I asked participants, you can see that patients themselves are reporting the physical toll that EDS takes on them. Like that's a, a pretty significant toll. Um, and EDS also severely interrupts op optimal functioning. Um, so since I'm really interested in this relationship between um, what kinds of things predict functional disability and these physical symptoms that we know are so disabling for, um, for patients, um, I, I wanted to look more into this question. So especially since EDS patients experience such different symptoms, I wanted to know, do these symptoms on the left here, um, do they predict functional disability? So kind of lumped them together this way. Um, so in addition to that open-ended question, I also asked children and adolescents with EDS to complete questionnaires about these symptoms on the left, about their pain, fatigue, and other physical symptoms. And I asked them a lot of other questions, too, like things about their social support, their anxiety, depression. And I wanted to see what, which of these all impacted their functional disability, um, the things on the right. So I found that there were significant relationships between all of these symptoms. Um, and the functional disability, right? So these symptoms on the left predicted that these areas of functioning on the right. Um, and these relationships between these physical symptoms and functional disability were stronger than those between social support anxiety and depression and functional disability. So these physical symptoms were better predictors of disability. Those other factors that I mentioned, anxiety, depression, and social support still play a role um, but these physical symptoms, and it makes sense, these are the ones that patients are reporting are, are the biggest, the hardest thing for them. These are most closely related to functional disability. Um, so that's a kind of a long-winded way of saying, so if I'm very focused on trying to increase functioning, decrease that disability, um, it's probably really important to address these physical symptoms that are negatively impacting functioning. Right? That's a, a major limiting factor. So we need to find out what influences these symptoms um, to try and decrease the effect that they have on functioning so we can improve functioning and quality of life. Um, so in order to think about these things that influence symptoms, um, luckily we have models that kind of set the framework for understanding the factors that influence symptoms. Um, so this is a, a model of the biopsychosocial model. So this model shows us how three types of factors, biological factors, psychological factors, and social factors, all influence physical symptoms such as pain. So this model can be used to understand other symptoms as well, um, but most participants reported that pain was a top concern of theirs, um, so it's probably going to be the, the language that I fall into using as a default if I don't mention symptoms in general. Um, so this biopsychosocial model draws from all three types of factors, biological, psychological, and social, um, and sees if these factors also interact with one another to influence physical symptoms. So it's not just factor, not just one factor from one area, but from all three, and these interactions between them, um, which, which can be illustrated as I talk a little bit further about some of these factors. So let's start first with the influence of biological factors. Um, the most obvious biological factor might be genes and medical conditions such as EDS. Um, so these things obviously influence one's physiology and the emergence of physical symptoms, um, right, so the conditions that one has. Um, so aside from EDS, we should also keep in mind um, comorbid medical conditions. Um, you all are well aware that there are me other medical conditions that are commonly co-occurring with EDS and these may have associated symptoms with them. Um, so kind of all of that falls into that biological bubble to influence physical symptoms. We can also think about biological processes that influence symptoms, such as, such as pain processing and sensitivity. Um, we know that the sensitivity and processing of pain signals is influenced by genetics, by our past painful experiences, um, and then by other things like our health habits, like sleep um, and exercise, um, we know that there's a lot of research out there on how sleep is related to physical symptoms such as pain, um, particularly the quantity of sleep that we get, so getting sufficient sleep, but also having high, better quality sleep. So if you have poor quality sleep, that's also productive of, of an increase in symptoms such as pain. Um, other health habits 
such as physical activity is also protective against pain. So engaging in regular physical activity, having your body um, um, produce those endorphins that are the body's natural painkillers um, can influence our perception of pain and physical symptoms. So not just thinking about the medical conditions, but kind of the broader um, health and the health habits that one engages in can help us to understand physical symptoms. Um, next we have physical, or we have the influence of social factors, such as support from family and friends. Um, and this can support, this can impact symptoms as well. So having social support can make coping with physical symptoms easier. Um, while experiencing stress, probably naturally it makes sense, when your social relationships can increase physical symptoms. Um, so stress um, almost always makes the experience of physical symptoms worse. It increases pain, um, can increase our fatigue, right? Which push, puts more stress on that autonomic nervous system, um, making it harder um, to, to cope with symptoms, and it can exacerbate the experience of symptoms as well. Aside from those personal relationships that provide either stress or support, um, stress stemming from family problems or neighborhood stressors, all those kinds of things in your social environment can also influence symptom severity. So it's the same kind of process with stress exacerbating symptoms um, and environmental forces also in influencing your stress levels, but they may also, those envi environmental forces may also interfere um, with one's ability to get adequate medical treatment, um, so kind of indirectly increasing symptoms in that way. So kind of stepping back to look at that social environment. Um, it's also important to look at other important social contexts um, for children, such as school. Right? School is a big source of both support and stress for, for children. Um, they get a lot of their peer interaction at school. That's one of their primary tasks is to attend school and to learn at school. Um, school is a major part of a child's life, and there are many areas that can be stressful. Thinking about the social relationships, um, both maintaining that and, you know, things, especially through adolescence, can be stressful in, in navigating social relationships and changing social relationships. Um, but also if, it's, if a child has missed a lot of school, that kind of social implications. Um, other kids might be curious about why they've missed so much school or might be suspicious. They might ask questions or kind of not want to ask questions. Um, so all of this can be stressful, stressful for a child as well. Um, again, with attending school, children have to work towards maintaining concentration in the classroom if they keep up with homework. Um, and sometimes just physically making it through the day can be difficult. Um, so there are lots of areas um, in, or ways in which school can cause stress for a child. Um, so it's important for families to find advocates um, in the school system um, to try and help them navigate some of the difficulties and provide support for the child in school, um, and also to help them find the right accommodation. So probably through a combination of working with their medical providers um, and with a team at school, trying to figure out what accommodations are necessary that will help the child both attend school and engage in important activities at school um, that can help provide some relief from stress for the child um, and it can ultimately help them cope better with, uh, with their symptoms. Um, so this last bubble, psychological, and I'm sorry my words were too big and kind of fell off the line there, um, but these psychological factors also affect symptoms. Um, so kind of your perceptions of these symptoms. Um, so just merely how much attention that you pay to symptoms can increase or decrease symptoms. Um, so I think we can all think of a time where we are experiencing um, pain or fatigue. And, you know, if you're out with your friends, then you might be distracted and, and kind of enjoying what you're doing. And you might be able to put that, that symptom out of your mind a little bit. Um, whereas if you're spending time by yourself, if you're at home alone, missing out on those activities, um, then you may be more likely to pay attention to that symptom. And that, I mean, the more attention we pay to symptoms can um, make, it, make it more severe, more present in our mind, more disabling. Um, it, right? If anyone who's watched sports has also seen this. So athletes are really good at this. When they're in the moment in the game, um, they're able to kind of put their pain out of their mind and engage and do what they need to do. But you can see as soon as the play stops, as soon as they're on the sideline, um, they're grimacing on the sideline and they're really, they have more time to, or um, more mind space just to focus on the pain and that increases the perception of the symptoms. 
Um, so other perceptions, how we think about our symptoms, how we think about pain can affect the experience as well. So if we're worrying about pain and other symptoms and how it will impact our ability to do the things we had planned that day, um, then it's going to increase. Again, any kind of worry is going to increase the, the um, autonomic nervous system and that pain signal. Um, often individuals with pain will naturally anticipate the pain. Um, so oftentimes our patients with EDS report to us that so one of the things that's most stressful is the inconsistency of symptoms. Um, so it's not that you have pain, it's that you don't know when it's going to crop up and get in the way. Um, so when symptoms like that are inconsistent, it's natural to worry about, oh, well, I, I'm not in pain now, but it, I might be soon. Um, and when you're kind of always on edge and looking out for it, waiting for it, um, that can cause more stress. Um, and it can just bring, again, your attention to that symptom, which can increase it as well. Um, finally, mental health conditions such as anxiety and depression can influence symptoms, they can exacerbate symptoms, and they can also just make it harder to cope with a chronic medical condition. Um, so it, it's natural to feel anxiety and depression when you have a chronic medical condition, and especially when it is impairing functioning, um, but then it can also just kind of double back and make it harder to cope with. Um, so the idea of this model, this biopsychosocial model, is that all of these factors influence one's experience of symptoms, um, and they also interact with one another. I was tempted, you know, to draw even more arrows here to show how the, the, there's interrelationships between factors, um, but rather than making this example totally incomprehensible, I thought I would just talk through another example about how these factors influence one another. Not only do they um, impact symptoms individually, um, but together they, they interact with one another. Now, so this figure shows one of some of the many factors that might interact um, and come to reduce children's functioning. Um, so here at the top, we have pain symptoms. Um, in, in the, when you're, you experience pain, um, a natural reaction is to have negative thoughts. Um, so negative thoughts, um, like, I've got this pain again, it's going to impact my function, I'm not going to be able to do those things that I want to do, you know, no one's going to want to be around me, um, that might influence your decision to stay home. Um, if you decide time after time, you know, these symptoms are really bad, I'm not going to be able to do what I want to do, and no one's going to want me around, then that might lead to a pattern of inactivity. And when we don't engage in activities regularly, then the result is physical deconditioning. Um, so our muscles um, decondition rather quickly, right, is you've got to use it or you lose it. So when you are not used to engaging in physical activity, then your body really um, doesn't have the same capacity that it did before for, for activity. Um, staying home and missing out on these important activities can lead to feelings of frustration. The physical um, aspects of it that you're not able to do what you previously were can lead to frustration um, and naturally worry about the next time. Like, oh, I've missed another thing. You know, I don't even know if I should commit to hanging out with my friends again because, you know, this is just going to happen again. Um, and that worry that we talked about and the uh, physical deconditioning can just make it more likely to experience more pain in the future. So we can see how this relationship can repeat itself and how the factors influencing functioning are multifaceted. Um, so it's best to use multiple strategies to try and interrupt this cycle and improve functioning. Um, so that leads us to coping strategies. So I like to think about coping strategies as putting together a toolbox of options to have ready for when you need them. We need this, we need this toolbox um, to try and break this cycle. Um, given the variety of factors that influence symptoms and functioning, we want to draw upon a variety of strategies to fill up our toolbox. Um, if the biopsychosocial model can explain the different factors that increase symptoms, um, then we should refer back to it and choose tools um, from all of these um, aspects to decrease the impact of those symptoms as well. Um, so your toolbox should include tools from all different domains of the biopsychosocial model, biological, psychological, and social tools. And the purpose of these tools is to help manage the symptoms that one experiences as a result of EDS um, and to improve functioning. So if we can kind of do those things hand in hand, hopefully um, we'll accomplish both goals of decreasing symptom severity and the impact of symptoms 
in increased functioning. Um, now, every tool doesn't work in every situation. Sometimes a biological tool will work. Other times you might have to try a couple of different psychological tools to get the job done. Um, and so these tools and skills are options for patients, um, and having a variety of tools for different situations is going to be most helpful. Um, now I'm going to spend a little bit of time um, and go over some of the tools that we might want to think about adding to your own toolbox. Um, so let's we'll start with biological strategies. Um, so as was stated a, a couple times already, um, but probably bears repeating, some of these strategies might be best um, thought through with your medical provider who knows your situation, your medical conditions, um, your, your limitations, and what kinds of things you might need to build up to. Um, so this might be a team effort in, in developing these tools and thinking about the skills that you can have here. Um, so the first tool I have here is therapy exercises. Um, so I'm thinking of exercises that you might learn in physical therapy. If the purpose of these exercises is to get you stronger, to help you function in the way that you want to, um, so that you are able to function for longer in doing those things that you want to. I know a lot of people get frustrated with their home exercise program or with physical therapy. Um, they feel like they can't do those exercises or they aren't getting results. Um, and if this is the case, you know, I, I encourage people to talk to their physical therapist about this um, rather than just give up and say, oh, I'm never going to be able to do it. Um, it's your physical therapist's job to help you troubleshoot um, those exercises and try to find, help you find ways to make progress. Um, and they can think really um, creatively about how to find exercises that are going to work for you um, and maybe be able to modify them for times that you're feeling more or less able to engage in those exercises. Um, so I think of home exercises kind of as a program and a routine, but they can also be used as tools for when pain happens or when other symptoms emerge. Um, so I'm thinking about if, if um, you're experiencing pain a certain way, thinking about the stretches that you can do or maybe shifting positions, kind of getting up and just getting your body moving and moving through the, the symptoms that you're experiencing can sometimes kind of shift the way that your body is um, is processing those symptoms and, and the exercises that you're engaging in. So in addition to those therapy exercises, I've already mentioned that regular exercise is one of those health habits that helps to improve pain over time. Um, so regular exercise um, releases endorphins that fights pain in the body, um, also makes you stronger, so less likely to experience that deconditioning, um, and it can help tire you out during the day so that you can get a better night's sleep. Um, and as I mentioned, sleep is another one of those tools that can help decrease pain. So when you have disrupted sleep or poor quality sleep, you're more likely to experience more pain. Um, so getting good sleep on a good regular schedule, getting enough sleep, um, and minimizing naps during the day is, is an important tool as well. We don't think of it as a tool to help us with our symptoms, uh, but it really is. Um, I mentioned minimizing naps during the day. Um, so in order to get good quality sleep at night, sleep research shows that you have to build up the sleep debt during the day. So staying on a regular schedule where you're going to sleep at the same time and waking up at the same time is going to help you get good quality sleep. Um, and taking naps in the middle of the day can kind of interrupt that cycle and reduce that sleep debt for the end of the night. Um, naturally, a lot of people are going to need rests during the day and need to space out activity. That's absolute. Take rests, um, but just keep an eye out for um, long naps that might interrupt that regular sleep cycle. Um, and then medication in is a key tool for many people, again, as prescribed um, and as talked through with your medical provider. Um, let's go through some psychological tools that can go in your coping toolbox. Um, so relaxation strategies that many of you have probably learned a variety of strategies. So things like deep breathing, progressive muscle relaxation, guided imagery, listening to relaxing music. Um, so just like this toolbox in general, I like to offer a variety of tools and a variety of relaxation tools in particular. Um, I think relaxation strategies are, um, I think, one of the, the easiest things to go to, and I, I personally find beneficial across settings. 
Um, so I like to teach a variety of relaxation strategies um, because I find them helpful, but also everyone has different preferences. Um, so some people really like deep breathing and some people don't want to do deep breathing at all. They would rather just listen to their their music um, and that helps them relax. So that's why I offer a variety of tools because some people have preferences and then you'll find that some tools work in some settings better than others. Um, so posit engaging in positive activities can also be a positive tool, um, especially if you're finding it hard to motivate yourself um, to engage in activities or to do exercises or if you're finding yourself feeling down, um, purposefully thinking of positive activities that might be enjoyable is going to be important um, to trying to connect to those positive activities or things that you used to enjoy doing. Um, so finding out those activities and sometimes it takes work to plan them out and actually go do them and it can be hard to find the time and force yourself to do them when you might have other competing uh, things competing for your attention, but it can be a really powerful tool to consider. Um, so thinking strategies. First, I'll talk a little bit about distraction. Um, so I mentioned distraction earlier as thinking about where your attention is. It just, you can use distraction as a tool to shift your focus from the physical symptom that you're experiencing to something else. So this can help promote functioning and improve pain by reducing attention to the pain and thinking, putting your focus on something else. If we're thinking about distraction strategies, active um, distraction strategies are better than passive strategies. So things like playing a game, playing a game, talking to a friend, um, engaging in a craft, whatever it is that your interests are that are going to be good, just positive distractions for you are going to be better than passive distractions like watching TV. Um, other thinking strategies that can be used um, might be thinking of ways to combat negative or unhelpful thoughts. So instead of thinking about negative things and trying to instead focus on the positive aspects of something, thinking about the successes that you've had or acknowledging your ability to cope with difficulties. So instead of thinking this pain is never going to get any better, um, it, it's never going to get any better. I, it's always going to be here and interfere with things. Um, trying to think instead of ways that you've been able to cope in the past, things that you're still able to do, kind of shift that positive focus. Um, and then finally, the, under the psychological tools, I have addressing mental health concerns. Um, so getting support for mental health concerns such as anxiety and depression is going to be an important tool um, for um, patients with EDS. So it's natural to experience, again, anxiety and depression um, when you have an illness that's limiting your, your functioning, um, and it helps to get additional treatment to alleviate these symptoms of anxiety and depression. Um, so having anxiety and depression in combination with a chronic medical condition make it difficult to use these coping tools effectively, um, and it kind of exacerbates those physical symptoms, um, so addressing those mental health concerns with other professionals is another important thing to consider. All right, finally, let's go through the social tools here. Um, so getting, gaining social support from friends, friends and family, getting that positive social support. We mentioned how friends and family can be a, a source of stress and or support, um, and when they're supportive, it can, it can help decrease the effects of pain. Um, it can help support you in positive coping and support healthy habits. Um, so you can use your social support to help you achieve other goals. So you can help um, promote healthy habits. Um, and it's helpful to have a walking buddy or someone to um, kind of meet up to help them reach some of their goals. Um, they can offer encouragement. Um, and, and distraction at times when symptoms are rough. Um, school is another common source of support or stress for children and adolescents. Um, so trying to find those advocates in school, maybe having a buddy at school that can help support the child in school, um, and just having those accommodations. So I know we've worked with lots of families to find different levels of accommodations that are going to be helpful for them. So having access to the nurse's office, um, or a counselor who's helpful and supportive if they have something flare up during the day, having a space where they can practice some of their other tools or have access to medication, have other supports for writing in the classroom or stretching in the classroom, 
um, whatever works best for you or your family, whatever you need, trying to problem solve with the school and with your medical providers about what's going to be helpful. The final social support um, in this toolbox aspect um, is that we've heard from many patients that having medical providers who understand their situation um, is important to making coping with EDS easier. Um, so I hope that families are able to find um, providers that are able to offer support if possible. This can be a really useful tool to trying to find that provider that you connect with that understands your situation or at least try makes the effort to try and understand your situation. Um, and a lot of times people don't see eye to eye with medical providers, right? You might have some communication difficulties. You may have different goals in mind. Um, and you may have to talk about your different viewpoints to try and see if there's room for compromise or see if we can um, build understanding from both sides. Um, so trying to find how we, you can use that communication and that relationship as a positive tool can be helpful for a lot of families. Ooh, there's a lot of tools in there. So in, in thinking um, about this toolbox as a whole and putting together this coping toolbox, um, you want to have tools in each of these categories to increase your options of tools available for when you need them. Um, like I said, you want to have some variety to choose from when you need them from each of these buckets. Um, and, and, and I want to talk a little bit now about how to use those tools. So it's not just enough to choose these tools that you might want to use in your toolbox, um, but let's talk about how to use these tools. Um, so some tools, in order to get some of these tools in your toolbox, this might require doing some research, um, reading a book or a blog on the, on the topic, um, trying to find that relaxing music or relaxation um, exercises online that you might like to engage in. Um, it might it require getting some training. Um, so thinking about mindfulness, right, that can be something that benefits a lot of us, um, and it requires a little bit of training with someone who's knowledgeable about that. Um, if you need help thinking about how to combat those negative thoughts, that might be something to work with a therapist on um, to try and add those tools to your toolbox or to learn home exercises that you can do or to figure out what that level of exercise is. You might have to work with a medical professional to, to add those tools to your toolbox. Um, and sometimes you have to make detailed plans to use these tools. Um, so sometimes it looks really easy to put, have all of these tools in these different buckets um, and just think, oh, I'll just pull it out whenever I need it. But sometimes you need to actually purposely make a plan. So making big changes takes small steps along the way. You can't just go from not attending school to saying, oh, well, now I've talked to my teacher and I've got some accommodations. That's fine. I'll have to go to school full time. Right? There might be incremental steps along that way that you might need to plan out and have support on to make that, that transition a success. You don't want to try to do too much too fast. Um, and then that results right in negative feelings about failure. You want to build up to those support, those successes, um, feeling successful along the way. There may also be um, tools that you want to use that you want to purposely think about using. So in terms of tackling a big activity like like going to the prom, right? It was just prom season. I saw lots of pictures of teenagers going out dancing all night in their pretty dresses and handsome tuxedos. Um, that might be a big task for someone who hasn't been out for a while or thinking about the physical demands of dancing um, or just being awake late at night. Um, so you might have to actively think about how can I work to attend prom but do it in a way that works for me. So thinking about how to pace your activity throughout the evening, breaking it down, finding places like, okay, if I can find a bench at this time, how long should I should I think about realistically being on my feet before I need to have a seat? And can I have a buddy that's going to sit with me so I don't feel bad about missing out? Um, and can I have someone, you know, check in with me and if I need more support throughout the night? So actively thinking about making that plan um, can help you to use these tools um, in a way that you might not think about until maybe it's, it's too late and you're going to need a lot of tools or more time to recuperate. Um, right, if you overextended your time by dancing all night at prom, um, doing a little bit of trying to recuperate at the end of the night probably isn't going to make a whole lot of difference. And then finally, implement the coping plan. So hopefully your coping skills will help make man 
make the symptoms more manageable, um, allow you to improve in your functioning. Um, oftentimes, plans don't pan out exactly the way we want them to, especially the, the first time. So we try to implement the plan, revisit the plan, see what worked, what didn't, um, and we kind of problem solve and provide extra support. Um, and a lot of us need some extra support, and especially for children and adolescents, that's where the role of family comes in. I'm going to transition now to talking about the role of family. Um, and when I talk about family, you know, I'm going to talk probably a lot about parents, but this also relates to other caregivers, other family members, or supporters who aren't family members, but important people in adolescents' lives. Um, they, they all have an important role to support adolescents. Uh, but when we think about the specific role that parents play for adolescents, um, it can be kind of complicated. So the period of adolescence is full of transitions. Um, so biologically, the adolescent body is changing dramatically. Um, cognitively, adolescents are thinking about the world around them differently, um, and teens are extremely keyed in to what's going around them socially. Right? They're paying attention to all these things and thinking about it in a different way. Um, all of these changes are working at the same time, and they're working towards the goal of increasing the adolescent's independence and growth as an individual. Right? During adolescence, we need to figure out who we are, um, and to do that, um, families need to walk this fine line of supporting their teens and granting them independence um, and, and that can be tricky. That can that can feel like a tug of war. So sometimes we think of adolescents growing up and growing apart from parents. Um, and while they do increase their independence throughout adolescence, um, it, they also it is possible to maintain a close and supportive relationship while helping them grow in their independence. Um, it's the the struggle here is striking the balance between this tug of war of supporting their teenagers, granting them independence, and it's hard to find that balance. Um, this balance isn't something that you figure out once in adolescence and you find it and you have that balance forever. Um, this balance is forever a work in progress. So sometimes adolescents will demonstrate their maturity, will increase their independence, um, and sometimes they'll face challenges and they'll need more support and supervision from parents. Um, so this process ends up looking more like a zigzag back and forth between more and less independence rather than a straight and clear path. Um, but it's something that families are, are, are constantly working on and finding the right balance that works for them at the time. And if striking that balance wasn't complicated enough for patients with EDS, um, this is compounded by the fact that EDS and chronic pain conditions in general run in families. Um, so as we know, EDS is a genetic condition. Um, so children and adolescents with EDS are likely to have other family members experiencing EDS. Um, and from our clinic, and even if families didn't know of another family member with EDS, um, almost all families reported that they had another family member who had a chronic pain condition in general. This is important to consider because we know that chronic pain negatively impacts your quality of life, um, and it puts all family members under stress. So having a child with chronic pain, even if you don't have your own medical conditions, is extremely stressful, um, and having this additional stress puts more tension on the parent-child relationship and can make communication difficult. Um, furthermore, many family, um, fam there are many family factors that influence coping. Um, so we learn coping skills from watching other people in our environment. So children learn from their parents as models of how to cope with negative experiences. Um, and so this looks a lot of different ways for families who have um, histories of chronic pain. Um, so children might see their parents coping well with chronic pain. They might see them when they struggle coping with chronic pain. Um, when parents experience a lot of negativity around their own condition, which of course is natural, um, or when they're overprotective of a child with pain, again, they want, want to make sure that their child's not overextending themselves, um, this can, can impact the child and relate to higher pain and higher functional disability in children as well. On the other hand, some individuals experience having their pain dismissed by their family members. Um, and similarly, just as 
paying too much attention to pain um, can have negative consequences. Dismissing one's pain also has negative consequences. This obviously results in experiencing distress that no one, that someone, especially someone close to you, isn't believing your report of the symptoms that you have, um, and frustration that you're not getting supported around this difficult thing that you're experiencing. Um, so families play an important role in helping their child cope with EDS. So specific things that parents can do. Um, so first, it's important for parents to support their children. Um, they can be their biggest cheerleader and their strongest advocate for getting the medical care, getting the supports they need in school, just their emotional support in general that they need. Um, so it's important to provide that support for them, um, but also important to do that in, the, in an appropriate way where you're challenging them when it's appropriate. Um, so supporting your child doesn't mean that you can't also push them or challenge them um, to work at something that might be difficult, like using a coping strategy and trying to do something um, even when it might not be comfortable to do home exercises and all of that. Um, also important for for parents to be developmentally um, involved, so being involved especially with younger children, um, but also allowing children more independence as they grow older. I think it's really important for parents to also be learning what their children are learning. Um, so when I'm working with families um, and teaching coping skills, um, to children, I like to introduce the skills to parents as well. So I might not be working directly with parents and teaching them every last detail, um, but I like to tell them that we worked on relaxation exercises or thinking exercises. So parents kind of have an idea of some of the tools in their ch child's coping toolbox um, so that they can help support them. They can offer, rem offer reminders um, to engage in some of those coping strategies and problem solve. Um, when coping strategies aren't working. So learning along with children also helps them to have a shared language. Um, so when I um, talk about coping strategies, and I give you a lot of information in a brief period of time, I try and draw it out when we, when we talk about it um, individually with families. I give them more background on the physiology of stress and how these coping strategies can combat physical symptoms. Um, so that everyone has kind of a shared um, perspective and language about talking about the problem, how to use coping strategies and those things that um, can kind of shift our attention um, or, or thinking about these specific tools. Everyone kind of is talking about it from the same perspective. Some other things to keep in mind for parents to support positive coping. Um, so when we're talking about engaging in coping strategies, I encourage parents to focus on coping and encourage coping strategies um, and focus less on symptoms. So a lot of times parents will check in with their, with their children when they notice that they're not doing well, that they look like they're in pain or they're just not acting themselves. Um, so they'll ask them, like, how, how are you feeling today? How is your pain? How is your nausea or dizziness? Um, and I often tell parents that if you have to ask your teen or your child that if they're not doing okay, then you probably already know the answer. So then rather than focusing on the symptoms, try and shift the focus of the conversation to coping and try and ask about like, well, what have you done? Like, what are, what are you thinking about doing? What kind of strategies do you think you can use? Have you tried some relaxation today? Have you done your home exercises? Um, so trying to minimize that focus on symptoms um, and, and, and catch them successfully using strategies. So when you see them independently using coping strategies, you know, praise them for doing that. Catch them being good. Encourage those activities because that's ultimately what we want for, for children to be their own problem solvers and to do this independently. I also encourage parents to kind of set the expectation um, for children's functioning. Um, and as much as is safe, you know, what you've determined with your medical team, um, try to encourage normal activity, even with symptoms. Um, so one of the things about learning to manage things like chronic pain is to try and engage in some of those activities, even when you're having symptoms. Um, so trying to set those expectations for children um, and have, you know, kind of a natural progression of consequences. So engaging in those activities, and if you have to skip an activity, if you have to miss something, um, not 
not engaging in something else that might be inadvertently rewarding, like watching TV or having a break from doing your normal chores. Now, those expectations that you'll go back to those after you've tried some coping or after you've recuperated, um, trying to focus on maintaining that normal activity as much as possible. Um, so that kind of covers that that last point, too. Um, but the last point on the slide that I haven't covered, be aware of how much worry and concern you express with your child. So, again, trying to focus on how you're talking about these symptoms. Um, if you're very worried and concerned about the symptoms that they're experiencing, um, kids are so quick to pick up on that. You can be doing it in the other room and not in front of them, and, and they'll notice. Um, and so when no, kids notice when you're worried, then they start to worry too. Um, so again, trying to focus on actively coping and focusing on the things that you can do to manage symptoms. Um, so we want children to focus on coping independently, but we all need help sometimes. Um, so with that, here's some suggestions to help problem solve issues when they come up. Um, so. When, when we're thinking about problems that come up with um, with coping, we want to work on one problem at a time, and we want to pick problems that are within our control. Um, so the first step is to identify those problems, try and identify one thing that you want to work on at a time, um, and focus on things that are within our control. Um, like I'm having trouble functioning at school with my pain, um, not so much things like that. This medication isn't working, right? That's a, a question for the doctor. Um, so we want to set a goal. What do we want? So we want to set goals that are doable and specific. So if we work through these steps with an example such as backs and hips, your back and hips hurting from sitting in a desk at school, um, thinking identifying that problem um, that you that you are having pain from sitting in the desk at school, setting a goal. Maybe the goal it could be a couple of different goals, but it might be just not having pain, or it might be trying to stay in the classroom and not have pain interfere with your with your learning. Um, so brainstorm. So explore coping options. So this is where we try and think about all the possible tools in the toolbox. Um, we might think about taking a medication at school, um, getting up and stretching, or taking a walk um, to kind of stretch out that back and hips. Um, that, that are getting in the way from sitting for so long, thinking about psychological things that you can do, such as trying to distract yourself or do some relaxation breathing in the classroom. Think about social support, so talking to a friend for distraction or talking to the teacher with the teacher for ideas. Um, so brainstorming, there are no bad ideas. Um, but then you think about the possible outcomes of those coping options. Right? So in thinking about all of those options, you might think, well, talking to a friend for distraction is probably not a great idea in the middle of class. Um, but maybe I want to talk to the teacher, think if she can help us brainstorm some more. Maybe I need to take a medication or maybe I can stretch and take a walk to the water fountain. Um, so you want to pick one of those options to test and you want to try out those tools. Um, so in, in trying to test these tools, important to think about testing each coping tool for a reasonable amount of time. Um, so you want to try at least for a couple of minutes. Taking one taking one deep breath isn't going to solve the problem of deep breathing and getting rid of the symptom. Um, but trying to do, use it for a reasonable amount of time, then maybe problem solving, picking a tool from another category um, if a, one category is not helpful in that situation. And thinking, again, just because one tool didn't work in this situation doesn't mean that we throw out the tool. We might want to keep it in our toolbox for another situation. Um, we might have to mix and match our coping tools and our, our problem situations to try and see what works best. So in trying to problem solve and support adolescents, um, and I think any parent of adolescents would acknowledge that conflict sometimes erupts. Um, sometimes comes about. Um, so the, the font got a little messed up on the title of the slide here, but it was troubleshooting if, if crossed out and when bolded. So troubleshooting when conflict emerges um, because it's almost inevitable when there's a lot of stress happening and when you've got adolescents who are trying to figure things out but also dealing with symptoms and trying to do these things independently. Um, so here are some tips for troubleshooting that when, when there's conflict, um, because I think working through it is worth it because that support that parents and family members can provide to um, children because because um, um, that can be really meaningful. Um, so when conflict emerges, trying to keep calm, 
take turns talking, right, making sure that you're not interrupting the other person um, and not lecturing either. So either parent lecturing a child or child lecturing on how parents don't understand isn't going to be helpful. It makes the other people, the other person involved feel not valued. Um, so that's not helpful. But to take turns talking and listening. So being an active listener and making sure that you stay back things that are important to make sure that you fully understand the other person's viewpoint. Um, being honest about your experience, your feelings, and using I statements to talk about your thoughts and feelings are important um, rather than pointing out things that the other person is doing, such as blaming them. Um, also, not helpful to refuse to speak. Um, so if you, if you have, well, this isn't going anywhere, I'm not going to say anything. If you're not participating in the conversation, the other person can't uh, um, learn your point of view or understand where you're coming from. Um, and bringing up past failures can just add to frustration. So really trying to focus on the specific issue that um, families are, are trying to work on. Um, so just some, some broad um, tips for how to um, handle conflict when it emerges because working through it is worth it. Children truly value the social support that their family members give them. Um, so I talked at the beginning of the talk about things that children and adolescents talked about were the hardest things to deal with with EDS. We also asked them what makes living with EDS easier. Um, and the number one answer that they gave was having support, having social support. That was the most common answer. Um, so that lasting at last quote at the bottom of the slide, having friends and family that support you was a theme that was brought up most commonly by our teens and adolescents. Um, but I wanted to illustrate some other things that make living with EDS easier. Um, and again, these were open-ended questions. I didn't bribe the patients with um, ideas of the coping toolbox, but you can see that they all independently brought up tools from each of the categories. So biological tools such as medication, staying active, doing physical therapy, psychological tools such as distraction, educating myself, the awareness of the disorder, having a positive attitude, um, and of course those social supports that families and parents bring to the, to the teenagers um, is going to be so crucial in helping them cope and effectively use these other coping strategies. All right, so some takeaways. That was a, a, a long run through of a lot of different topics, but some things that I just wanted to end with. Um, so we found that adolescents with EDS experience functional disability across a number of different domains, um, physical functioning, social functioning, um, and many factors contribute to this functional disability, specifically the physical symptoms that teens experience. Um, so since there are these multi-factors, then a multifaceted approach to coping is also going to be the most effective, um, using all the coping, coping tools that we have available to us. Um, and for parents, thinking about that social, that the support and independence are not mutual, mutually exclusive. Sometimes it feels like that tug of war, but thinking about how you can provide support for teenagers but also allow them independence as appropriate um, is probably going to be some of the best approaches that you can take. Um, so being structured in your expectations, your support for them, but being flexible, right? We know that if this is an, a moving target in adolescence. Um, and all the things that we have to think about. So being flexible with our teens, but being supportive with them um, and kind of having expectations with them will help them reach the goals that they also want to, to reach. All right. Well, thank you for letting me talk so long about all these important topics. Um, I'm going to open it up to question and answers. I know it's been an active Q&A board, and I've been trying not to focus on that so I could get through my content first. Um, but oh, I wanted to um, pull up the Q&A also. Great. Thank you, Susan. Um, we're looking forward to um, seeing what kind of questions the live audience has for you. And I think there's about 15 questions up there so far now. Um, Great. Live, the live people can continue to add some questions as you're talking if they wish. And okay. um, can you see the list? Yes, I can see the list. Yes, thank you. So you can go ahead and read, read it out loud and answer answer them uh, if if it applies to your to your area. Absolutely. Um, so one question here: Do you promote encouraging our children to push through the physical discomfort to avoid missing out? 
Um, I think that's a really important um, question, and you know, every every family kind of takes a different approach. So I try to work with families to see what kind of things that they want to um, focus on, because it is a, a delicate balance, and a, and a if you push through, then you're probably going to pay pay for the um, pushing through that you did later on. Um, so I try not to say, you know, just push through it, you know, suck it up, just go do what you're supposed to do, um, because that's not helpful and that doesn't validate um, the, the child's experience. Um, so instead, I try and think about what coping strategies people can use um, and what we can do to kind of make, break down an activity so that they can still engage in it, because really the missing out factor is huge, especially for teenagers. They don't want to miss out on anything. Um, so I try and see, like, what is it that we can reasonably still engage in so that you're not exacerbating your symptoms to a terrible degree, um, but maybe are there things that with an, an increase in using our coping skills, making those more effective, that we can balance um, that with kind of breaking down activities and do them in reasonable amounts that you can still um, that you can still participate in things that are particularly important to you. Um, so I hope that, that answers that question, kind of thinking about the balance and, and working with the, that balance because everyone's balance is going to be a little bit different. Um, all right, so, so what is the best way to talk to kids about their pain without reminding them? Um, so this is good. This person um, gave me the age of the child that they're specifically talking about because this is important. So when we're talking to kids, we have to think about how talking to an 8-year-old is going to be very different than when you talk to a 16-year-old. Um, so for an 18, for an 8-year-old, the younger kids, um, you might need to um, might need to check in a little bit more often. That's probably a case where this is a little bit more of a new experience. Um, for you and for your child and with a, with a young, with an older child. Um, so in, in talking to younger kids, you know, if they're talking specifically about medication, um, that it takes a while after med, after you administer medication to get pain under control, um, I would, you know, check in regularly about how things are going. You know, as if medication is scheduled, then that's really easy. You don't have to check in about symptoms. You can just give medication. Um, as they get a, a little bit older, you know, you can probably start talking to an 8-year-old about, you know, can you come to me when you're having symptoms so that you're not reminding them, right? Because when you check in with them, that's an automatic reminder and helps them to then focus on the pain, um, which may make it worse. Um, trying to um, encourage them to come to you independently when they need medication or just giving it them on a schedule so that you don't have to check in with them. Um, and then just trying to focus on coping. Um, so if they are having a difficult time, you're likely going to notice. So instead of asking about symptoms, right, you could say, um, what do you want to do about this? You may have to coach them early on when they're younger. Do you, do you feel like it would be time to take a, take some medication? And then what else can we do? So then coupling it with another active strategy, is there a relaxation strategy we can try? Is there an exercise we should try? Um, thinking about the, the next step is the, the other coping strategy that you can engage in. Um, and for older kids, I try to be really hands off about reminding them or checking in. Um, so, you know, for older kids who have, may have more experience about knowing when they need medication or knowing if this is normal for them, um, then I, I don't check in as much. Um, I think it, it depends on whether you're in a, a state of flux also, right? If there are a lot of changes happening with medical conditions, then it may be important for your teenagers to check in with you um, and, and tell you when things are different. So I always tell families with that caveat, right? Like, obviously, we don't want to bring attention to symptoms, but obviously if something is different or changing, then we, we want to know about it so we can help them the best. Um, is there an age that the risk of depression or anxiety increases. So yes, so for younger kids, um, we start to see anxiety increasing before depression. Um, so for, for school age kids, mostly older school age kids, so getting close to junior high, we see an increase in anxiety um, and then depression usually catches up in the junior high years. 
Um, so usually see, we see a bigger increase of both anxiety and depression around the time of adolescence or around the time of puberty. Um, and at that time, we also see um, differences in um, across sexes. So for um, younger children, we see equal numbers of males and females who experience symptoms of anxiety and depression. Um, for older kids after puberty, we see an increase um, and we see higher incidence of anxiety and depression in females than we do males. Um, so I try and keep an eye out for that um, for, for older kids in particular because we know that that risk is higher in teenagers than in elementary kids. Um, but we still talk about positive coping with younger kids as well. Um, oh, So this is a question about um, anxiety and depression treatments, again, medication specific. Um, so I, I, I believe that medications can play an important role for children with anxiety and depression. Um, I like to always couple medication therapy with um, cognitive, ther cognitive behavioral therapy where they're also learning um, skills to help manage anxiety and depression when it comes up. Um, so I think that it can help in trying to get anxiety and depression under control. Um, and as this um, question points out, it can ease the cycle of pain leading to anxiety, leading to more pain, leading to more anxiety. Um, I don't have any recommendations for specific types of medications. Um, that would be something that would be best discussed with a child psychiatrist. Um, there are lots of things to keep in mind, and I, I would be hesitant to make any recommendations um, depending on various ages of children, medical conditions that they may have. Um, but I, I do believe that it's worth exploring if you think that anxiety and depression is a significant factor in how a child copes with pain or having EDS in general. Um, all right, let's keep moving on the questions. Um, question about new anxiety. Um, so if new anxiety is emerging, um, I kind of just repeat my, my question or my, a little bit of my answer before. Um, so when anxiety is cropping up and it, it comes on really suddenly after, um, a, a diagnosis, um, then I think that it's something definitely to check out, right? It might be that it was a big transition in receiving a diagnosis, right? This is a big thing for any person to deal with a new diagnosis. Um, but when it significantly alters their functioning, um, especially for kids and teenagers, um, that can be a lot to deal with. So it's probably worth exploring with, um, with a therapist or a psychologist, um, first to see if there are uh, behavioral methods to try and get some anxiety under control um, and, and then consider the role of, of um, medication, if that would also be helpful. Um, so I mentioned a little bit about CBT, uh, so cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, so a lot of those things that I put in the bucket of psychological therapies um, fall under the umbrella of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and so this is a type of skill-based therapy that has the most evidence um, for being effective for treating anxiety, depression, and pain conditions in children. Um, so actually, it's something I, I meant to mention, but I failed to, is that I, I like a lot of these coping tools because they can do double duty. Um, so I've actually had the experience of treating someone for anxiety um, in, in my graduate school clinic um, and then going to work in a, um, in a GI clinic and having them come back with, with um, abdominal pain. Um, and it was, it was um, really easy to say, oh, you know all of those coping strategies that you worked on to manage your anxiety? Here is how they can also apply to this pain condition. Um, so that's something that I really like about that is that they, they're effective for all those symptoms, anxiety, depression, and pain, and some other somatic symptoms as well. Um, 
and they can they can do the job for both. They can get the job done for for all of those. Um, so again, this is the cognitive behavioral therapy. And if you find someone who can provide these skills, um, you know, some people are hesitant to uh, treat children or adolescents if that's not something that they've done, or treat people with medical conditions. Um, and you can have um, you can you can offer some education too that you know these are some of the similar strategies and they might need a little bit of tweaking, um, but a lot of the strategies translate the same way. Um, so I like to use those those therapies for these conditions and in conjunction with medication because medication can help take the edge off of these symptoms. Um, but we see that the combination of medication and cognitive behavioral therapy has the best long-term outcomes um, as people learn these skills and techniques that they're able to manage these symptoms on their own. Um, another question here mentions mindfulness and meditation um, as forms of treatment for EDS symptoms. Um, absolutely. So mindfulness and meditation um, are closely related to some of those relaxation strategies that I talked about um, but mindfulness is a really nice way of um, kind of taking the focus off of all of these things that can be distractions like stressors and pain um, and really building a practice of focus so that you could become very skilled at shifting your focus. So I think it can be very powerful for people with chronic medical conditions where management is going to be the long-term goal. Um, and the question is, can t these techniques be taught to young children? Um, and they can. Um, it's really neat to see how um, the practice of mindfulness and meditation um, can, with a few tweaks, apply to all sorts of age groups. Um, and so you might use different strategies, right? You might not use some of the, the deep, reflective, long silences that you would for adults who are better able to sustain your attention, um, but you might do things that are a little bit more physical and tangible. So you might have kids focus on something that's in the room. So I, I like to use nature because I think that that's a very calming setting for many people. Um, so you can have people, um, you can have kids focus on one thing. You can have them focus on a blade of grass or a flower. Um, I've even heard of people teaching mindfulness to kids to watch a bird as it flies away and focus on it as long as you can until it goes off into the distance and you can't see it anymore. So some of these simple practices can be adjusted to kind of teach the um, basic concepts of mindfulness and meditation in a way that's um, reachable for younger children. <coughs> um, so that might be something that you can do some research online on your own to find some practices or ideas to kind of brainstorm and start your practice. Um, or you can look for maybe workshops or practitioners in your community um, who might be skilled at this. I think that's an asset if you can find it, but it might be hard to find. It might be something that you're better able to um, to find online. Or, or I think people are very willing to share practices that they have found to be helpful. Um, I think you can do a Google search to find that. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Oh, so this is a, a good question about some of the different cope, different relaxation coping strategies. So I offered a number of them, um, like deep breathing, progressive muscle relaxation, autogenics, meditation. Um, and which is most effective for EDS? Um, so that's a good question with no clear answer. Um, I think your your point here about wondering whether some of these coping strategies might not be so good for people with EDS, so progressive muscle relaxation, the possibility of tr triggering muscle spasms for some, um, I think that that's a, a good point. And so when I offer these strategies, I do check in with people about how they how they're receiving them. Right? And obviously, if there's something that they're doing that's making them more uncomfortable, then we, we just move on to something else. So some people don't like the muscle relaxation. So progressive muscle relaxation is one where you focus on individual muscles, you tense that muscle, and then you relax it. And the idea behind tensing it first and then relaxing it um, is to try and feel the difference so that, you know, if you're not aware of how tight some muscles are, then you're able to feel the difference between tight muscles and loose muscles. 
Um, and so for some people, it might be an adjustment where you take out the tensing part so that you're not triggering those muscle spasms. You're just focusing on the muscle relaxation. Um, and that might be something that you try on your own. Another way that I've tried to modify it um, is that through biofeedback, I know that you had a talk on biofeedback a while back. Um, that's a um, tool in which you can, together with a, with a practitioner, find, like, kind of identify the muscle tension that you have in certain muscles. Um, and so through that, you could kind of measure the tension so that you're kind of identifying are there muscles that need to be relaxed. Um, and once an individual gets good at just relaxing that muscle, then they can skip the, the um, tensing part of it, um, or they can try a different um, strategy altogether if that's triggering for them. Um, I haven't had – so some people will report that autogenic, so trying to focus on a body part, making it warm and heavy, again, with the goal of relaxing the whole body part by part. Some people um, ha have been too skilled at autogenics and have um, been able to make body parts too warm by focusing on that. Um, so in that that's another case that not very often, but sometimes people re will report is uncomfortable for them. So I, I won't do that with them if they know if they report that that's uncomfortable or making them hot or uncomfortable. Um, deep breathing. I some people will tell me that deep breathing doesn't work. I very rarely have adverse reactions to deep breathing. I will coach people that when they're practicing deep breathing, we'll just do a few at a time. Um, and if they notice that they're getting out of breath or lightheaded, then we'll just adjust the pace of it. Um, so I find deep breathing to be very therapeutic. Um, and, and again, some people have strong opinions that they feel that they feel great about it. They don't feel any difference, or maybe a little bit of difference. So that might be something worth exploring with a little bit of tweaking um, to see if we can get it to a point where it is um, relaxing the body. Um, but I haven't had any adverse effects with breathing or meditation. Um, so, again, I think that all of these tools, I, I teach all of these relaxation tools, um, you know, one at a time and practice, give enough practice for each to see which one works for each individual, um, what people like, what they might like in different situations. Um, and then test it out in the real world. So the thing is practicing them, getting skilled at them so you know how to do them. But it's something that you have to build up as you know, and have practice with so that you're ready for it for when you need it. Um, just like an athlete doesn't just jump into the game without a practice, right? You can't expect a coping tool to be effective in reducing your symptom if you haven't practiced it um, and, and gotten gotten pretty good at it. Um, yeah, okay, so let's think about some other ones. Hmm. So this is a question about um, communicating um, with with children who uh, try to hide their pain um, because they're aware of the family um, the family history of pain and functioning. Um, so so it sounds like the, these um, children are very thoughtful and trying not to be a burden on others. Um, this parent wants them to open up so that they can help them. Um, so that's a good question. And I think that it might be something that you could try to approach on working together. Um, so if they are stoic and hiding their pain, you know, maybe it sounds like they might be either, they might be functioning, they might be, might be engaging in some activities or not telling you when they're having pain um, to kind of protect you from telling you when, they, when they're struggling as well. Um, so you might just check in instead about coping. Um, because again, I, I, I think it's beneficial when the focus is on coping rather than on symptoms. So obviously you want to know, um, you can express to your children that you want to know when things get worse, when they're struggling with things because you want to be a support to them um, but if you want to make a habit of checking in with them, you might try to focus on coping and try to say, like, wow, I was really proud of you for getting through this activity or this school day. You know, I know that you've been dealing with a lot. What were some of the strategies that you used to get through it? Um, and so you might be 
focus then on the coping that they engaged in, how they were successful. So then you're praising them for their successes and for working on this independently, um, also acknowledging the work that they're doing um, because they're probably doing good work in order to, to hide this from you and to be functioning as well as they are. Um, so, oh, this is, so this question is a little bit different than the other. So what is your per personal relationship to EDS and how did this become such a great interest to you? Um, so I, I mentioned I'm a pediatric psychologist and I've done a lot of my work in pain and GI clinics. Um, and so I've come across patients with EDS very often in these different clinics. Um, and I'm kind of always drawn to um, these patients that have had these these diagnoses that weren't really fulfilling diagnoses, right? I think that a lot of people get relief when they get the diagnosis of EDS. If they have something that can explain some of their symptoms, but it still doesn't give you a very clear treatment path a lot of times. Um, and there's a lot going on, and it can be very complicated. Um, so I think I've been really drawn to trying been trying to understand all of these different factors, um, but also try and tie it together, not just for myself, but for the patients as well. Um, so I've had the experience where I've seen patients who have been seen in a variety of clinics, in pain clinics and GI clinics and neurology and physical therapy, orthopedics. They've seen all of these specialists, um, and then when they've come to me to learn some of these coping strategies, now, before I jump into these coping strategies, I mentioned that I give um, some education first. We talk about how the body processes, processes these symptoms. Um, and so I kind of, I, I try to acknowledge the different things that they're dealing with. So I've talked to, I, I had this one patient where I talked about how all of these processes um, talked about, or how the, all these processes um, contribute to pain, but also to nausea and also to dizziness and to uh, your POTS. Um, and so when I can kind of give this overview and kind of tie it all together, I've had a patient say, you know, I just went to all of these different disciplines. I've seen all of these providers, but no one has tied it together for me like that. Um, and I just think that that's so powerful, that that's a, a missing system in our, in our medical system, that we don't have the opportunity to really bring these disciplines together and try and get this understanding from all of these different disciplines at the same time, um, that medical, especially for, for physicians, um, are so busy that they, they really don't have the time to talk about how these different systems are all connected and influence the system, um, the symptom. Um, and then I just think it's a really interesting opportunity for psychology, right? Not being some, not being someone who can prescribe medication and think about all these very complicated biological processes. Um, I think it's really, I think it's really cool to, to use a not very technical term that we can use coping strategies, biological or um, psychological coping strategies that actually can make a difference in these physical symptoms that are real biological processes, but in tying it all together and thinking about healthy habits um, and psychological coping and these other conditions um, that we can offer real tools that can um, make, hopefully make a real impact um, in families' lives. Um, let's see. Mm -hmm. So this person is talking about um, their child's very positive attitude about their situation, um, about the different conditions that they're dealing with. Um, how do we keep him looking forward to his goals that he really cares about to work towards more home exercises and healthful eating? Um, so this is a good question, right? It's great that your child has a very positive attitude. Um, I, I think um, getting that positive attitude is, is a big battle. So the fact that he has a good attitude is a, a great place to be starting with. Um, and it sounds like he has some outlets, too, to avoid isolation. So I think that that's one key to, pr to providing a positive attitude is to keep kids connected. Um, so they want to connect 
with their peers, with other meaningful adult relationships, their family relationships. Um, and I think that the, the Internet has actually, for, for all of the troubles that the Internet gives us, it's also been a very powerful tool for helping kids to connect with others when they're unable to get out um, as often as they'd like to. Um, so to work towards other goals, um, so it sounds like they're they're thinking about other um, health goals, such as participating in home exercises, eating healthy foods. Um, I try to reach, I try to motivate kids towards those goals, right? And I think, man, if we had the the key to motivate us towards doing our exercises and healthy eating, um, then we would be rich because everyone wants the key to mo- be motivated to work in those areas. Um, but I think that, you know, relating it back to the specific goals that he has. So it sounds like he's got goals that he really cares about, um, thinking about those things that he would like to get back to. Um, so if he wants to get out and see his friends in person or go to a certain events that might be related to the, the games that he enjoys playing or, playing or the activities maybe at school or with his friends, um, thinking about how you can relate those home exercises to being uh, stronger, being able to engage in those activities more readily um, might be a good thing to do, kind of use that as something to relate towards those goals. Um, have him participate in setting the goals. Um, so if there's something um, that you want to work towards, to like, okay, so I think that these, this thing is going to be important, but it might be hard to do. Like, what do you think is a reasonable goal? Um, and with a I, I don't know how old your child is, but wasn't a relatively you know, young kid, so like at older elementary schools, definitely by junior or high, you know, they can be an active participant in helping to set goals for themselves. Um, and, you know, from, from my perspective, I, I never shy away from a good behavior chart. Um, so sometimes I have to make myself sticker charts to reach my goals. So if you re- if you set a goal um, and kind of break down the steps, like okay, we want to exercise four times a day. If we get if we make that that goal, we exercise four times four times a week. Um, get four stickers on our chart for the week, and then what can be the goal? Maybe um, you know an, a special outing or something um, that can also work you towards those functional goals. Um, but be something to work towards. Sometimes we need a little bit of extra push or motivation to reach those goals. Um, another thing about these things like engaging in healthy habits like home exercises, healthful eating, even engaging in coping strategies, that can be something that multiple family members can get involved in. Um, and so sometimes kids feel singled out if you're focusing on the exercises that they have to do or the diet that they have to engage in. Um, and if it's something that might be a, a good, a positive change for other family members as well, you might kind of make it a team effort. Um, so you might focus on, okay, like home exercises are difficult to do, but as a family or here's a person in the family who can be a, your, your exercise partner and kind of set aside that special time where they're also getting social support um, for doing those exercises or eating those healthy foods, coming up with, with recipes together um, that someone might enjoy um, can be all ways of making those, reaching those goals a little bit um, more fun or at least less painful to work towards. Um, all right. I'm going to keep scrolling through some of these questions. Do you have any advice for helping children communicate or articulate what they are experiencing and decrease embarrassment over being different? Uh, so feeling different is one of those things in adolescence that you know, no, nobody wants to feel different from their peers in a bad way. Um, I think there comes a point in adolescence where teens want to establish themselves and stand out, be a little bit different, but usually in, the, in a good way. Um, and so some, it's a lot of times having a medical condition can be being different in a bad way. Um, so I, I think it depends on who you, who you want to communicate this with. So this is commun- helping children communicate, articulating what they're experiencing. Um, so if it's something that you feel like they, they need to think about or process that they have this condition, feel that they're not coping with it very well, what their experiences are, and they're not really feeling open to talking to you. Um, 
you know, I think it's important for them to get that support somewhere and maybe have that outlet, but sometimes it's good not to push that too, to having them articulate what they're experiencing if it's something that they're they're not feeling um, comfortable talking about. Um, so, you know, for some kids, they might feel more comfortable journaling about their experiences. I don't know if kids have physical journals anymore these days, um, but having a place where they can privately kind of explore that on their own, what they're experiencing, um, sometimes having a counselor or a therapist, another resource person to check in with them um, might be good. You know, sometimes children are kind of funny. Like they really want that support from their parents. Sometimes they don't want to share everything with their parents because they want the, they want the support from them, but they don't want to have to rely on them. It's a tricky balance that um, kids put us through. Um, but having somewhere for them to have that outlet and support, I think, is important when they're ready for it. Um, and to decrease their embarrassment over being different, I think, you know, just having conversations with kids about how everyone is different um, and – um, you know, everyone, ex you, you never know quite what everyone is experiencing, um, and, and everyone feels different in some way. So sometimes it might be you know, having a conversation about you talking about a time that you felt different from other people, um, maybe talking with them a little bit about what is the things that they feel different about. Um, you know, some things they feel different about because it's very obvious that they're missing things, like they're missing a lot of school. Um, and then you can kind of try and talk to them about how they shouldn't be ashamed of that. They didn't have any control over that. Um, and that, that's not something to be embarrassed about. Um, but also validating their experience that it's difficult when you can't participate in the things that your peers are participating in. Um, sometimes it's talking with teens about how they feel different than their peers. Um, but, and, and they think that everyone is noticing the ways that they're different than their peers, um, but, but it's not something that they, they really might notice. So um, one example of this in, with my coping strategies is that I have some people say, like, well, I, I like the deep breathing, but, I, you know, I have to be in my room to do that. I don't want anyone to know that I'm using my coping strategies. Um, and I tell them, like, it, it might feel like you're the only one doing deep breathing and that, that, that everyone's noticing that you're doing something different than them. But actually, no one else is going to notice that you're breathing because everyone else in the room is breathing, too. They're only going to notice when you stop breathing. And that's one of those examples where teens think that everyone's noticing the thing that they're doing, um, but really all, all teens are, are really focused on themselves and how others are looking at them. Um, so I think it's kind of an, on, an ongoing conversation, um, really validating their experiences that, you know, what they're going through is tough and it's tough to feel different and to miss out on things, um, but that everyone has something that they're dealing with. And just because you can't see it or you don't know about it doesn't mean that everyone else doesn't have something that, that they're feeling insecure about as well. Um so this question is about um, issues with anxiety, depression, and coping, um, but refusing to see someone about it. Um, so this is, this is always a tricky situation at, at any age um, when someone is struggling with anxiety or depression and could really benefit from seeing someone about that, um, but, but is refusing to see someone. Um, so I think what you can do in the meantime is try and, and, and be supportive, but also, you know, you have to watch out for yourself. You, you support your children already in so many ways um, that if you're trying to support them and their feelings of anxiety and depression and it's getting overwhelming, um, then you might need to make watch out for your own um, support too, right? you got to help the helper. You have to be taking care of yourself in order to be an effective helper of them. Um, so support them the best that you can. Um, and, and if you're noticing getting, getting in the way of other things, try and talk with your child about what, what it is that they're noticing or thinking about. Um, so if the child's refusing to see a therapist, is it because they're embarrassed? Is it because that they don't see it's a problem, right? Those are, those are two different things that might offer two different solutions. Um, if they don't see it as a problem, 
then you can kind of gently talk about some of the ways that you might see it as being a problem. Um, not so much calling it that, but saying, you know, well, I, I know that you don't think this is an issue, but I'm noticing that you don't want to go out with your friends as often. Or I notice that you spend a lot of time worrying about your homework or the things that are going on with your friends. And I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about the level of worry that you're having or how this is affecting um, your ability to cope with this and that. Um, so trying to talk with them and seeing how it might be helpful um, to see someone, um, you know, best, the best that you can. Um, and, and, you know, depending on the age of the child, right, it's much, much easier to, to pick up a younger child and take them somewhere um, that they don't want to go than an older child or a teenager. Um, but doing the best that you can, saying, you know, I think that this is important that we do it, and maybe you do it together. Again, maybe it's something that you offer to start doing together, trying to, you know, de destigmatize the importance of getting help from mental health conditions. Um, and, and, and just doing your best. But I applaud your efforts to try and get her the help she needs and I encourage you to stick with it. I know it's a, can be a long battle. Um, but hopefully I think she'll eventually appreciate your support of her. Um, and hopefully, um, come to appreciate the support that other people might be able to, um, might be able to help. Um, uh, so this technique of distraction is very useful for kids, but people outside the situation are confused at how a child can function better when distracted and then ultimately assume that there is no pain. This is a good point. Um, so uh, so we know that this distraction can be very useful, um, and we notice it all the time, right? So um, even docs, even some of my um, physician colleagues who are very skilled at this, can sometimes say, well, this child reports that they're in so much pain, but they don't look like they're in pain when they're in the waiting room or when they're in their iPad, right? And we have to remind them, like, well, yes, they, they are saying that they're in pain, and when they say they're in pain, then they have the pain, but we know that pain, when you're distracted, the pain isn't as intense as it is when you're asking them about it straight on and there's no, um, there's no distraction. So I think the advice on handling this depends on the situation and who you're talking to. Um, so if, um, it, if for schools in particular, this might require a lot of education on your part. Um, so a lot of times people in schools might be willing to help, but they might not have a great understanding of what it is um, that you need to think or why things work the way they do. So. Um, I think telling teachers that these are the things that we're focusing on, we're focusing on coping, we're focusing on distraction. I mean, if you're at that point, that's great that you can just you kind know, of talk about the specific things that, that are helpful for your child. Um, but then, yeah, you do um, sometimes run the risk of some people misunderstanding. So um, this is where it's important for there to be good communication. And um, I think the parents on here are, are awesome advocates. Um, for kind of explaining that, you know, what we're doing, part of this plan is to, is, is we want our child to be in school and we want him to be distracted and we want him to look like there's no pain. And this is where you have to educate people that they are, my child is still experiencing these symptoms. Uh, they have pain, you know, ex explain the extent that they have pain every day or whatever it is appropriate for your child. Um, but we've been working really hard to get to this point where they can come to school even when they have pain. Um, so we want to reinforce them, and when they do tell you that they have pain, then we want to um, respond appropriately as well, right? So using those coping strategies, trying to dis distract, um, trying to um, can continue engaging in these these uh, in the functioning and what they were doing before. Um, but not being dismissive when they tell you that there's pain because we were trying to validate their experience of them too. Um, so that's a, a good question. Um, how do we support them when they want to work, when they want to work but too much makes the pain way too much and they can't function the next day? This is tricky um, with kids. So when, um, especially with teenagers, right? As, as adults, even it's hard for us to pace our activities. Or sometimes we end up doing too much 
and end up paying for it the next day. So with kids, they might need a little bit more guidance and help pacing their activities and realizing this pattern that they're in. Um, so it might be kind of journaling, like how much did you work that day or keeping track, like how much were you doing, how long were you engaging in this activity, and then what was your what were your symptoms like the next day. Right, let's try and identify that pattern and break it down so we don't get stuck in this every time you go to work or every time you go to hang out with your friends. Um, and what can you do? So try, this might be someplace else that they might need help problem solving. Um, and thinking, okay, if you're working a shift that's this long, can you take breaks at these intervals? Can you sit down from time to time? You might have to be very mindful and plan this out with kids. Um, so what we know about adolescents is that they, they know this logically and they can think about this and the consequences. But in the moment, especially when there's, like, gut-level decisions to be made and social influences, um, they, they're not so good at making those split, split second decisions. Um, so you're going to have to be very planful with them to help support them um, in making those decisions and structure the time so that they're able to pace out those activities. And I think that's the thing to keep in mind, pacing the activities so that they're doing what they can but not too much. You don't want to underdo it so that you kind of get fall out of that pattern of being active, but you don't want to overdo it so that you're um, – that you're uh, overdoing it and then paying for it the next day. Um, so it's good for your child for working through it, but try to try to do it in a thoughtful way and using strat coping strategies to make it manageable and break up those activities. Um, so let's see. Recommending proactive therapy or counseling for kids with chronic illness like EDS. So I think that... Um, you know, therapy and counseling can certainly be helpful for kids when they need it. Um, if kids are functioning well and they're, you know, feel like you, you seem like they're coping well emotionally and still engaging in, in their activities and aren't experiencing a lot of disability, um, I, I, I don't know that you need to start therapy right away if it's something that they're not struggling with, right? It might be helpful to have have a meet and greet with a therapist so that you know someone's with problems emerge, then you have a relationship with someone already. Um, but it depends on your situation. If you've got a lot of other things going on, a lot of appointments or activities that you're trying to get to, it might be difficult to fit in another um, therapy appointment. Um, and you might not want to uh, institute something else that might um, might take up time and resources or or Maybe if the child's not thinking that that's going to be helpful and you don't think that they ultimately need it right away, um, it might be not be something that you need to focus on right away. Um, okay, so let's see. Hmm. So someone has a question about specific muscle spasms. Um, I'm not the best person to answer that. That might be something to help um, to ask your um, physician or uh, maybe a physical therapist about. Um, I'm, I'm not I'm not skilled in the way of muscle spasms, so I'm afraid I can't give a good answer to that. Um, how do you encourage them to get out of bed and figure out if it's their pain or using EDS as an excuse? And this can be tough um, because it's hard to function with the um, constellation of symptoms that um, that patients with EDS experience, and it, and it can be hard to get out of bed. Um, for me, I don't know how much of it. it so the matter, the question here is: figure out if it's their pain or using EDS as an excuse, and. For me, although when kids tell me that they're in pain, I absolutely believe them. I don't know if it matters for me um, what it is that's keeping them in bed. I want to try and focus on how to get them out of bed. So even if they have pain, and sometimes it can seem like a heartless approach, right? I, I know that they have pain, but ultimately staying in bed is not going to help their pain get better. Right, we have to think about what's been the plan that we've talked about with our team, with our medical professionals that we're working with, 
Do we have a medication option? Do we have a physical exercise option? Um, or can we at least get them just sitting up, right? And so sometimes it's going to be small steps. It might not be that you're going to go from get out of bed um, um, right away every time that you have pain, right? It might be small things at a time, especially if it's been an ongoing pattern. Um, but it's going to be important to get out and get up and, and do something. Um, because staying in bed is not going to help the pain get better, and it's not going to help you reach your other goals of, of functioning. Um, so finding something to do. And so this is a, a treatment plan that you might have to come up with a number of um, – uh, you might have to use a, a lot of resources or talk to different people to come up with the best plan for you. But having that expectation that every day – we're going to get out of bed, um, and if, if school is appropriate, right, going to school, I think that would be the ultimate goal, getting in the same rhythm every day, kind of regardless of what those symptoms are, and that's where learning these tools comes in very handy because you're going to need a, a lot of different tools to um, empower someone who's having so much, um, so, such severe symptoms that it's hard to get out of bed. Um, so really working to get effective tools get symptoms under control so that you have um, have uh, those tools that you need to, to get your child to function to what they need to do, what they want to be doing, whether it's attending school, engaging in activities with their friends. Um, all of those things are going to be a lot more reinforcing than staying home as well. Um, so I think I got to most of the questions. I think they're, I know we're, we're running low on time. Um, there was one other yeah. question here. It's just about the questionnaire that I use. Um, so I'm not opposed to sharing any of the study materials or talk more about my study materials. I don't know the best way to do that, but I don't know if that's something that we can hook up later about. But um, I would be happy to talk more about my research and the questionnaires that we've been using if that's been helpful, if that would be helpful for if, anyone else. If, if it's something that you're comfortable with um, posting, we don't mind posting that along with your lecture if that's appropriate. Okay, yeah, that might be something we talk about. I'm not sure that it's, it's not the fancy that. Don't worry that other people can talk to you individually. That might, you know, however that works better. Yeah, yeah, that might okay. be better. Okay, great. All right, and then I did see there was a question about support groups for children. And oh, yeah. um, that, what I would recommend, um, I can answer that for them. Um, as most of you know, we do um, have a network of support groups throughout the country. And uh, the best way to find out about ones that include uh, children would be just to contact uh, the one that's in your area. So you would go to our website at edsawareness.com or chronicpainpartners.com. And right there on the home page, you'll see a map and a pull down that gives you a directory of the support groups. Um, many of them will either include children in their um, in-person meetings um, many of them also do have separate um, times where um, children or, or teens can, can meet up, um, you know, just in their own peer group. So um, you can inquire that way. And um, if somebody's interested in starting a group for um, everyone or for, for all, all ages or for just children, <laughs> either one, um, and there's nothing in your area, please do contact us. We can help um, coach you on how to survey interest in your area and then um, also give you the free web pages to uh, publicize your new group. So uh, contact us at info at edsawareness.com if you're interested in that and there's not a group already in your uh, local area. And with that, I just wanted to thank Susan again. Um, we've had um, a lot of very positive feedback about your lecture from the live attendees. Um, comments like, um, this lecture was amazing. I learned so much, and I really appreciated the Q&A, and um, that it's been an incredible resource for their families. Um, and um, just very some very good practical information that you shared that they can just apply right away. And we just really appreciate all your time and your expertise that you shared with us tonight. Well, of course. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure to talk to you. And, you know, I, I talked your ear off, so I'm, I'm glad some people found it helpful. <laughs> oh, definitely. Definitely. We appreciate it very much. And um, just want to remind everybody that we do have webinars monthly. So if you're interested in um, signing up for announcements, uh, you can go again to the website that I mentioned previously. And on the homepage, there's 
um, a sign up for our free guide and webinar announcements and you'll get um, emails every time we have a new lecture coming up. And you can also go to the uh, webinars section on our website and you can see over 75 previous presentations on uh, various subjects related to EDS and um, other associated conditions and um, you can look up by specialty or topic. So um, we do encourage you to, to look at those. Um, and I guess uh, we'll go ahead and call it an evening. And um, again, thank you for all the attendees who, and all of your good questions that you asked Susan tonight. And uh, thank you, Susan, for, for your time. And yes, your thank you, thank you all for having me and for your excellent question. It was my pleasure. Uh, have a good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Good night.